Welcome to episode 28 of the Time Talks podcast, part of the Channel Zero Network. My name is Chris Time Steele, and in this episode, I had the pleasure of speaking with historian, scholar, journalist, author, and professor Kevin Young. Dr. Young teaches at the University of Massachusetts Amherst and is a scholar in Bolivia, Latin America, and political power, who often writes on social movements and propaganda. He is author of Blood of the Earth, Resource Nationalism, Revolution, and Empire in Bolivia, editor of Making the Revolution, Histories of the Latin American Left, and co-author of the new book out on Verso, Levers of Power, How the 1% Rules and What the 99% Can Do About It. In this episode, we talked about Bolivian history, colonialism, indigenous rights, anarchism, U.S. intervention, propaganda, the School of Americas, resource nationalism, and his new book, Levers of Power. Thanks to Awareness for the music, and here is a jingle by a fellow Channel Zero Network podcast member. Ransom notes. Anarchist and anti-authoritarian music podcast. That's going to come out every month. Ransom what? So what's like, I mean, what's your like ultimate goal, I guess, in the end of the year? We are for the Rising up against the oppressor. The attitude that you see in hip-hop. Let me uh, give you a sample of some of the uh, lyrics that had some of the older ladies among the stockholders quite with dismay. Go to ransomnotes.com or get them from the Channel Zero Network. So I wanted to start this interview with a narrative kind of opening to to your interests and and your life and what brought you to these these questions that you ask and the uh, the stuff that you write about. So I was wondering if you could explain what was a breaking point for you in thinking more critically about society, breaking through the spectacle, as like Guy Dubois would say, or like looking deeper at the hegemony of U.S. society. Mm-hmm. One of the really important factors for me growing up uh, in, in one of the important factors in my politicization as a person was uh, the music that I listened to um, as a teenager. Um, I was growing up in the 1990s in rural Pennsylvania um, in a mostly white small town. Um, and you know, I was fortunate to be exposed to some music that was politically radical uh, that had sort of found its way into into some mainstream exposure, uh, Rage Against the Machine in particular, and a few other groups like Dead Prez and The Coup, you know, over, overtly political music. And I loved the music, and the lyrics were very provocative, so I naturally wanted to know what the lyrics were talking about. Uh, so that was one of the um, uh, original factors that led me to start reading books and reading critical history books in particular. Uh, I remember reading Howard Zinn's A People's History of the United States. I think uh, when I was in junior high or high school, uh, I read it for the first time. And, uh, you know, from there, I, I just wanted to know more and more. The more I read, the more I wanted to know. Um, and the the standard history and social social studies curriculum that I was being fed in schools uh, just became more and more dissatisfying to me as I started to read these these uh, critical analyses and accounts of u s and world history um, on my own outside of school and I was fortunate to have a, a brother growing up uh, who was close in age to me who was uh, also politicizing at the same time and reading many of the same things and had a lot of political discussions uh, with him. And in, in terms of the way I was raised, I wasn't raised as a, a leftist. You know, my parents uh, certainly weren't leftists, uh, but they did try to raise me with certain uh, values, which I think were conducive uh, to to becoming a leftist. And they wanted me to be a conscientious and a considerate person not so much in a political sense, but more in a kind of interpersonal sense uh, in my daily life. And those values that I was brought up with almost require that one becomes um, an anti-capitalist and an anti-racist and anti-authoritarian and everything else. So those are those are the main factors that I would 
uh, point to in my my childhood in small town Pennsylvania. Nice. Thank you for sharing that. And uh, as far as like digging deeper into the leading you into your studies and those, what what brought you into uh, studying Bolivia in a uh, more deeper manner? Uh, I started studying Bolivia after the cycle of popular rebellions in Bolivia in the early 2000s. Uh, there's a big struggle that um, that gained worldwide attention in the year 2000, the, the uh, water war uh, with the, uh, uh, the government and in Bolivia and the World Bank and the IMF tried to privatize water in the central Bolivian city of Cochabamba. And there's a big mobilization against that. And the mobilization actually succeeded in um, stopping that privatization plan. So that was a big inspiration to me. And the, the various uh, movement mobilizations that followed in, uh, in the coming years in Bolivia um, also got my attention. And, you know, I had been reading so much about the history of U.S. foreign policy and the history of systems of oppression within the United States and, and capitalism and all of this stuff, which, you know, could could leave someone with a rather uh, gloomy outlook um, on the prospects for uh, justice and peace in the world. Um, and here I saw an example, a real live example um, happening in real time of a poor society, very oppressed people uh, taking back power and and really thwarting the designs of capitalists and uh, and imperialists, and uh, you know that was that was deeply impressive to me. And the thing that really attracted me to Bolivia was uh, the strength of organized civil society, the strength of organized social movements, and their ability to disrupt business as usual in the country and uh, and win real material and political gains by doing so. So, you know, the first time I went to Bolivia, I, I remember in the first few days I was there, I saw a parade of people as a sort of a, you know, annual celebration of some kind. And all of the groups there were carrying banners or flags representing their unions. And, you know, coming from a society like the U.S., which, uh, you know, where, where the labor movement has been so decimated, uh, very few people belong to unions. And I went to Bolivia and, you know, everybody's carrying flags or uh, insignia for their unions or their neighborhood organizations or their student organizations. And it just struck me as as uh, a more organized and more politicized society. So it was partly that that contrast with with my more uh, dismal, frankly, uh, perception of the United States at that time um, that uh, that got me interested in Bolivia. I like to I like to go into a brief history of of Bolivia's history of its some of its movements and politics from looking from Spain's imperialism in 1545 to Bolivia's independence in 1826 to the Chaco War. Uh, you've written about indigenous resistance and survival in Bolivia. And uh, you wrote one article about the 1947 upheavals on um, haciendas outside La Paz. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you could um, speak about this um, indigenous organizing and resistance and how it um, also had anarchist organizations with it. Yeah, so I think it's really important to um, look at indigenous resistance in Bolivia over the long term. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you talk to indigenous activists in the country, uh, many of them have this very far-reaching historical consciousness of resistance to Spanish colonialism. Uh, some of them even go back further and, and talk about resistance to the, the Inca Empire uh, prior to uh, when Spain arrived on the scene, because not all the, the indigenous groups in Bolivia were uh, <laughs> were uh, very favorable toward the Inca Empire, uh, and uh, so they locate their their current day social movements in the context of this long term historical resistance. Uh, and Bolivia was was really brought into this world 
economy that was emerging uh, in the in the 1500s in, in in 1545, like you mentioned, with the discovery of the Potosi uh, silver mine, uh, which was really uh, an earth shaking event uh, because of the enormous quantity of silver that was mined uh, from the Potosi mine um, using forced indigenous labor in the next several centuries. And uh, that silver had really far-reaching global implications. The silver was mined uh, from Potosí in particular and a few other places in the the areas that Spain had colonized in the Americas. Um, And it was taken to India. In India, it was used to purchase cloth Cloth, the cloth was then taken to Africa. Africa, in Africa, it was traded for uh, enslaved people, enslaved Africans, uh, who were then brought to uh, various spots in the Americas. So silver really played a, a crucial part in this emerging world economy, which which tied together all of these different con- uh, continents, and uh, which really gave rise to. Uh, the system of global capitalism uh, that would evolve over the next several centuries. So from the time that Spain arrives, and, and especially after the the development of the Potosí silver mine, there's a very strict racialized economic hierarchy that Spain sets up, uh, where indigenous people, uh, who are, of course are the vast majority, even after uh, Spanish people start to come to, to Bolivia, uh, indigenous laborers are uh, forced to pay high taxes to the crown, and they're also forced to perform obligatory, uh, back-breaking um, physical labor, especially in the in the Potosí mines, which was the the crown jewel of Spain's South American empire. So uh, this this racialized economic hierarchy is something that would endure long after independence in the early 1800s. For the, at least a, a century and a half after uh, independence, uh, up until the mid 20th century at least, uh, there's a continued pattern of indigenous subordination, politically, culturally, economically, and and legally. Uh, even up until uh, the 1950s, the the legal regime um, explicitly discriminates against indigenous people. So there's this this kind of bifurcated republic after independence, uh, where uh, the indigenous majority is locked into this subordinate, subjugated position, uh, actually is forced to continue paying what was called tribute or taxes um, long after independence. And in the late 1800s, one of the the notable changes in the late 1800s is a, a, a big push on the part of the Creole elite in Bolivia, the the lighter skinned uh, elite of European descent, uh, to privatize indigenous lands, and this is something that was happening all over the hemisphere, and in fact, all over the world at the time. And this was a, one of the key tenets of European liberalism was the privatization of land. Uh, and of course, most indigenous land at the time was communally held, collectively held, and and, and managed. And uh, in the late 1800s, the Bolivian state started aggressively trying to privatize and parcel out uh, those indigenous lands uh, in the same way that, you know, it happened in the rest of Latin America and also in the United States uh, with indigenous lands uh, after the 1887 Dawes Act, which uh, privatized vast quantities of Native American land in the present day United States. And but one of the things about Bolivia that was especially impressive is that in comparison with many other countries in the Americas, indigenous resistance to that land privatization was relatively successful. Indigenous communities in Bolivia succeeded actually in holding on to large quantities of of land, um, at least up until the 1920s, 1930s. And so there's, there's, even at the same time that uh, land is being privatized and um, indigenous people are being subjected to such violence and dispossession. There's, there's nonetheless this strong current of indigenous resistance, uh, which uh, took a variety of forms. There are many different strategies that indigenous communities followed, from filing court claims to try to defend their land titles, uh, to occasionally launching armed rebellions, and then everything in between. And some of the the, the novel forms of uh, resistance included uh, what we would recognize as labor strikes, where indigenous people who were forced to labor on haciendas, uh, 
landed estates sat down and refused to work. So they were called the huelgas de brazos caídos, roughly translated as sit-down strikes. Um, so in the 1930s and 40s, there was a big wave of these, these strikes uh, protesting the brutal labor conditions on haciendas, and in many cases also uh, demanding the return of lands to indigenous communities. So this is where um, uh, this this uh, one particular episode that I've studied comes in in 1946, 1947, uh, where there's an alliance between urban anarchists, uh, mostly mestizo anarchists in the city of La Paz, and the rural indigenous anarchists outside the city who are working on the haciendas and living in indigenous communities, some of which are still intact and still maintain their lands, uh, even after so many decades. So in 1946, there's a big um, there's a big push on the part of dozens of communities throughout the, the La Paz region to unionize hacienda laborers and to undertake this renewed uh, resistance against land dispossession and to try to to uh, achieve land restitution. So uh, the main focus of this though ends up being uh, the rights of laborers on the haciendas. So unionization is really the, the key focus, um, although there is also this other demand about um, land rest restitution and reclamation. So this is, a, this is a really impressive episode because it's an interracial, interethnic coalition of people explicitly identified as anarchists. Both the, the urban organizers and the rural organizers were united in this anarchist federation. And this is, this is a, a really key moment in Bolivia's mid 20th century history. And it really poses uh, a dire threat to the rule of the Creole elites in Bolivia. And they recognize just how threatening this, uh, this, this emergent coalition of urban and rural radicals is. Uh, and there's, there's a ferocious wave of state repression and landowner uh, repression. That, that's unleashed against this coalition uh, that succeeds in decimating the, the anarchist organization. And uh, it, after the late 1940s, the anarchists in Bolivia, uh, unfortunately, ceased to be a, a major uh, political force, largely because of this, this violent repression and, and incarceration of uh, indigenous activists. One of the other um, uh, key moments in Bolivian history uh, that I that I left out in the narrative uh, was the Chaco War against Par Paraguay in the early 1930s, 1932 to 1935. Uh, the Chaco War was was basically a product of a, a Bolivian government who uh, uh, Bolivian president Daniel Salamanca, uh, who was contemptuous of uh, of his people and chose to launch Bolivia into this completely unnecessary war that would have devastating human consequences. Um, on the Bolivian side alone, at least 56,000 people were killed, most of them uh, indigenous soldiers, either killed or, or died from disease in the Bolivian southeast. And this was, uh, this was, um, uh, 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 this, this had tremendous political impacts on Bolivia over the next two decades, uh, because the war really threw into relief uh, just how detached from, from, from the bulk of Bolivian society its government leaders were. So the president, Salamanca, uh, of course, a, a light-skinned uh, Creole or Mestizo leader, you know, basically didn't think twice about sending uh, hundreds of thousands of people into harm's way in the Bolivian southeast uh, for no good reason. Um, so the Chaco War really underscores for many Bolivians uh, just how venal and uh, greedy and corrupt and uh, morally bankrupt the Bolivian oligarchy and political class are. So after the war concludes in 1935, there's a huge wave of renewed political mobilization uh, by indigenous people, both in the cities and countryside, uh, by urban workers and uh, by the urban middle class as well. And that political mobilization develops over the next 17 years and 
uh, eventually culminates in the 1952 Bolivian Revolution, where there's a, a heterogeneous coalition of political forces that are grouped together under this party called the MNR, the Nationalist Revolutionary Party. And they come to power in 1952. And it's a, it's a coalition of, uh, essentially a coalition of, radical, of the radical left and uh, more middle class reformist forces. Uh, and it's the middle class reformist forces that um, ultimately hold the hegemony within that coalition. So it's it's an it's because of this mix of radicals and and middle class reformers, um, the policies that come out in the 1952 revolution are somewhat contradictory. But there are some major changes that happen after 1952. Uh, the nationalization of the country's mines, which is uh, something of certainly of historic significance, and uh, one of the other big reforms is a major agrarian reform. This is one of the biggest agrarian reforms in 20th century Latin America. Uh, about half of the country's rural peasants uh, would receive some quantity of land through that reform program over the next two decades. And this is also uh, a moment when uh, the government finally abolishes the formal legal discrimination against indigenous people. So universal suffrage is extended. The education system is is expanded. Many of the uh, explicitly anti-Indigenous and anti-peasant uh, laws that were on the books are, are discarded finally. So uh, that's that's another important moment. Um, and you know, I could I could go further up uh, up through the rest of the 20th century uh, if that's helpful. But I don't want to talk for too long. No, that was amazing, and you just covered about quickly 400 years of of history. <laughs> <laughs> I really appreciate you putting that so succinctly and very comprehensible. Thank you for that. And just to sure. to build into this a little more, so when we leave off with the MNR, this starts to get the attention of U.S. imperialism and U.S. intervention in Bolivia. And this is when we see the beginnings of the School of Americas being established at this time, I believe, in the late 40s. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, in in your book, you you speak about the FDR administration and the Eisenhower administration, who were speaking about Bolivia. And I was wondering if you could talk about a, a brief history of U.S. intervention. So going back to School of Americas, are now known as WINSEC. Uh, they had thousands of Bolivian graduates from Hugo Banzar Suarez, who took power in 1971 to Bolivian Captain Philemon Rodriguez, to General Williams Kaliman, along, mm -hmm. and then braided with this, along with propaganda movements such as the USIA and their role, as you mentioned in your writings as well. Yeah, so U.S. intervention in Bolivia has never been quite as overt as it has been in other parts of Latin America, like Central America, Cuba, and various parts of the Caribbean. Uh, there hasn't been a direct U.S. military invasion, uh, for instance, uh, but U.S. intervention has still been really significant in Bolivia's history, especially over the last 75 or 100 years. Uh, the main focus of that intervention, I would say, uh, has actually not been military, but economic in nature. Um, and we really see this after the 1952 revolution. Uh, one of the reasons why those more reformist and conservative forces within the MNR end up triumphing within that coalition is that the United States comes in on the side of the moderate middle class reformers. And it, uh, rather than trying to overthrow the MNR, it decides that it can work with the MNR and it, it decides to use United States aid as a, uh, as a point of leverage, as a lever effectively to try to steer the MNR in the direction that Washington wanted, pro-capitalist, pro-U.S. direction. So it, it succeeds in doing that uh, to a very great extent in the 1950s and 60s. It's, the U.S. can't prevent the mines from being nationalized. It can't prevent the, the agrarian reform from taking place. Uh, but it does succeed in staving off some of the other radical policy changes that were being demanded by the left in Bolivia at the time. 
And so the the U.S. achieves that not so much through military aid, although there there was a there was military aid given as well, um, starting uh, in the mid '50s, um, and that was an important piece. But the I would say the even more important piece was the economic leverage that the United States government had. Uh, by 1957, the U.S. was literally contributing one third of the Bolivian government budget each year. Mm-hmm. which gave it enormous political leverage, uh, and it was able to condition that aid to Bolivia on pro-capitalist, pro-U.S. policy changes. So uh, just to give a, a couple of examples, uh, in 1955, the United States, in coalition with these conservatives within the MNR, uh, imposes a reform that uh, partially privatizes the country's oil sector, uh, this is uh, the backstory is that in 1937, Bolivia had nationalized its oil. It was actually the first uh, Latin American country to do so. Uh, and that was one of the uh, consequences of the Chaco War and the, the nationalist and, and anti, anti-oligarchy anti mobilization that I, I um, talked about briefly before. In the 1960s, the United States uh, partially privatizes the mining sector, which had been nationalized in 1952 after the revolution. And uh, throughout the 50s and 60s, it also uh, succeeds in stopping the MNR from, from undertaking a really progressive fiscal policy. So in 1956, there's a plan, a, a uh, monetary stabilization plan, an austerity plan uh, imposed by the United States, uh, although, again, in, in conjunction with these um, allies within the MNR, to uh, impose uh, budget austerity, to cut social programs, uh, to devalue the currency, which uh, is, is one form of, of austerity because it's going to make things more expensive for the, the working class in the country. And uh, basically to to institute a lot of what we would today recognize as neoliberal policy measures. Uh, And this is 30 years before neoliberalism becomes a a commonly used uh, household term in in Latin America. So uh, U.S. uh, economic policy uh, and, and the U.S. use of aid as a political lever uh, to try to steer the MNR in the right direction. Uh, that's that's a really significant um, aspect of U.S. policy in the 50s and 60s, quite apart from uh, from military aid. Um, although, again, the, the the U.S. military aid to Bolivia did play uh, an important secondary role. One of the interesting aspects of, of this story, which I've studied a little bit, um, is the U.S. propaganda regime that it set up in Bolivia. Um, and this was this was a really extensive propaganda effort uh, where there was an agency called the U.S. Information Agency, uh, which operated all over the world. Um, and uh, in Bolivia, despite the fact that Bolivia was barely three million people in the early 50s, uh, this is one of the one of the most extensive uh, U.S. propaganda programs in all of Latin America at the time. Um, so the U.S. Information Agency uh, literally planted articles in Bolivian newspapers. Uh, it sponsored radio programs uh, without divulging the the source of the the content in those programs. It showed films uh, and newsreels all over the country. Uh, so this is a really significant propaganda effort. Uh, USAID, the U.S. Agency for International Development, uh, literally provided millions of textbooks for Bolivian school children. And that's, that's you know, again, Bolivia is barely three million people. Um, that that figure uh, is, is very significant given Bolivia's small size. And the explicit goal of the U.S. Information Agency throughout this time was, uh, just to quote one of their memos from the 1950s, promoting popular acceptance of private capital investment. So there was a big fear on the part of the U.S. that Bolivia was going to reject capitalism. And this fear was really grounded in reality because there was enormous sympathy in Bolivia, as there was elsewhere in the, in the global south, for the ideals which would come to be associated with the Cuban revolution. Socialism, redistribution, the empowerment of working class people, and the rejection of U.S. imperialism. 
So there's there's an enormous uh, traction that those ideas have, uh, even if people don't uh, agree with with everything about the Cuban Revolution. Uh, the basic sentiment is very pro-socialist in Bolivia and and so many other countries at the time. So the the propaganda effort of the U.S. is explicitly geared toward rolling back that that popular sentiment. It wasn't just trying to change the MNR's policies. It was also trying to secure, you know, what we later call the hearts and minds of the Bolivian people, because it recognized that uh, if you don't uh, shift the attitudes of the population at large, you're going to have a hard time holding on to the allegiance of the government and uh, uh, getting the government itself to, to do your bidding. So that's uh, that's a major effort in the 1950s and 60s. In 1964, there's a military coup where the MNR is overthrown. Uh, the M, uh, the U.S. is uh, supportive of that of that coup, and uh, even though it had li- it had liked the MNR, it nonetheless supports supports the coup because it thinks that the military regime is going to be more more able to guarantee its interests. So from 1964 to 1982, there are a series of military regimes, uh, most of which are supported strongly by the United States. So for most of that period, the U.S. is strongly supportive of those military regimes. Uh, you mentioned uh, one of the guys, Banzer, who ruled from 1971 to 78, graduated of the School of the Americas. Uh, so this is a time when, when U.S. military aid does become quite significant. And uh, that uh, legacy of U.S. military aid, uh, of course, continues to be important today. Um, some of the military leaders who participated in the November 2019 coup in Bolivia had been uh, trained at the School of the Americas, as some news reports uh, quickly began to reveal after the November 10th um, ouster of, of Evo Morales. So, you know, the the U.S. intervention, I think, has been especially economic in nature uh, with, again, this, this important uh, military component as well. And that, that's a pattern that's, that's held true um, uh, over the past 75 years. Yeah, and I think that's a, that's a really important distinction to make in looking at this lens of of Bolivia and the history is also with your scholarship you've written about resource nationalism and the different type of containment, but how it, it is economically based from from your scholarship. The reading that, that I got was the U.S. was constantly trying to feel out MNR and then see which would be most beneficial to them. And that's where kind of this, this resource nationalism as this term that you really focused in on your book came into play. And I was wondering if you could just give like a brief overview of kind of what this concept is. Yeah, well, the common narrative about the Cold War in Latin America is that the United States needed to intervene because the Soviet Union was was threatening to invade or establish uh, satellite states in, in, in the Western Hemisphere. And in Bolivia, there's really never any uh, realistic possibility that that was going to happen. And, and U.S. policymakers themselves conceded that point um, in their private communication. They recognized that Soviet-style communism, so-called communism, meaning this you know highly uh, bureaucratic, authoritarian version of, of socialism, uh, was never a realistic prospect in Bolivia. But what was a realistic prospect was that aspects of socialism, including the the empowerment of workers within the workplace, uh, the downward redistribution of of wealth and income, the redistribution of land on a massive scale, um, and the rejection of U.S. foreign policy goals, that was a realistic prospect. And uh, so one of the things that I really focus on in my work is what many people call resource nationalism. And this is this is just simply the the notion that the people who live in a country should be the ones to benefit from its natural resource wealth. So in the case of Bolivia, it's minerals, it's oil, it's natural gas, and and so on. Um, and this was arguably the dominant current in Bolivian political culture in the mid 20th century, and it remains very important today. And this was much more widespread a sentiment than than uh, explicitly communist or socialist ideas were. Uh, there was an organized uh, socialist and communist left, 
uh, after 1952. And they also shared um, this idea of, of resource nationalism. But uh, resource nationalism was much more widespread within the population as a whole. And this is, this is true of, of most of Latin America at the time. And, and if you look at, if you look closely at State Department correspondence in the mid 20th century, they're, they're pretty candid about this, that the main threat to U.S. economic and geopolitical interests was not, uh, this, uh, prospect that the Soviet Union was going to swoop in and establish this series of beachheads in the Western Hemisphere. The real threat was homegrown economic nationalism and anti-imperialism. Uh, so, I'll just give you a couple of examples. In 1951, I, I quote this this uh, memo in the book. A State Department official wrote that the U.S. government quote is engaged in trying to protect the interests of American investors in underdeveloped countries against the strong desire of those countries to expropriate and nationalize. And uh, he said that if if uh, there's a nationalization of resources in Bolivia. This would, quote, make it very difficult for us to protect the American owners of low cost mining properties in other countries. So that that document is just indicative of this overriding concern of of the State Department at the time to protect the interests of private capitalists and, and, and advance those interests however it could. Uh, so it doesn't say anything about, you know, the threat of uh, Soviets or or you know, Soviet-style communism in Bolivia. Uh, it's more focused on the uh, the concrete material threat to U.S. economic interests, specifically U.S. capitalist uh, interests. Thank you for laying that out so precisely. Next, I'd like to pivot to your your latest book that you mm-hmm. co-authored, which is Levers of Power, which uh, came out on Verso. And I wanted to uh, congratulate you on that. It's an awesome piece. Awesome Thank piece you. Of work. Thank you. So really, the the main thesis of this book that I found is that looking at a diversity of tactics or, or tactics for organizing with ninety nine percent against the one percent um, Occupy Wall Street language that really hit the mainstream then mm-hmm. is to not so much focus on elected officials but to attack corporate structures. And you all lay out case studies that show that this actually has uh, historically worked and currently caused change and, and is a good tactic. I was wondering, um, can you explain kind of how you all came up with this premise and some tools that you lay out and what is most needed in these times of of COVID and also white supremacist structures and violence and, and the political repression that's going on? and been exposed even more in the wake of the murder of George Floyd. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. So the the immediate impetus for the book was um, the early period of the Obama presidency, 2009. So, you know, you'll remember that when when Obama was elected, there was a lot of hope uh, around the country and even around the world that he was going to uh, usher in uh, a lot of grand progressive changes. Uh, and of course, that didn't really happen. And uh, even for those of us who were skeptical of Obama's uh, platform from the beginning, uh, many of us did, I think, expect a little bit more from the Obama administration. And you know, even the even the most skeptical leftist observers of Obama in 2009 may have been surprised at how there really wasn't much going on. There really, the administration really wasn't didn't seem to be pushing very hard for any major progressive changes. Uh, it seemed, you know, thoroughly subservient to the corporate elite. And uh, by the end of 2009, uh, Obama's first year in the, in the presidency, there really hadn't been anything um, too exciting that the progressive or the uh, progressives or the left could could rally behind. So uh, my co-authors and I, uh, we started talking about this as uh, the conundrum of the Obama presidency. That's the way we were thinking about it. Why, despite this enormous uh, popular mandate for progressive change, because Obama had been elected uh, with a pretty clear margin of victory. And if you look at opinion polls, the the public overwhelmingly supported some of the main progressive planks in his platform. 
So he he talked about uh, confronting climate change, the climate crisis, and you know the, the large majority of the U.S. public supported uh, major uh, aggressive uh, uh, measures to combat global warming and to uh, to restrict the power and 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 privileges of polluters. Uh, he talked about uh, universal health care. Uh, and, and again, a large majority of the public supported universal health care in the form of something like Medicare for all, uh, as, as the public does today. Um, but in terms of the policies that Obama pursued, that's not what we got. So that was the conundrum that we were looking at. And we started to, to see this as reflective of a much more general dilemma uh, within capitalist societies that even when you have an ostensibly progressive candidate who's elected to the most powerful office in the land, they are going to be enormously constrained, even if, uh, in, in Obama's case, it's not really clear that he wanted to, to undertake any uh, really ambitious progressive reforms. But even if he had, uh, he still would have been enormously constrained uh, by the forces of the corporate elite and by uh, some of the, the powerful state institutions like the Pentagon and its various agencies that that are really the ones who call the shot behind the scenes. They're really the institutions that control policy. So mm-hmm. one of the, the big arguments that we're making in the book is that it's it's really not politicians who design policy. They're not really the ones in charge. Uh, it's it's the corporate elite, and it is uh, a select group of state institutions, uh, such as the U.S. military and, and law enforcement agencies, uh, that are really the ones in charge because it's it's their cooperation that's necessary for any major policy change to actually be implemented. If they don't go along with the change, uh, if they don't like the change, they're in a position to thwart the implementation of that policy change. So we saw this in, in all of the major reform efforts of the Obama, Obama administration. The, the, the legislation that uh, the administration did actually seek to, to uh, usher in and, um, and implement. Uh, so the financial reform in 2010, the health care reform that same year, uh, and uh, in a variety of other uh, examples that I could point to. And there was every effort from the very beginning to get uh, the, the the corporate elite on board. So with the health care reform, the Obama administration started out from the very beginning by bringing together the pharmaceutical companies, the big insurers, uh, the, the big hospitals, um, the medical device companies, all of these big power players, which are, are really the problem. They're the heart of the problem in U.S. health care. But the approach from the beginning was to bring them on board and to try to try to come up with a recipe for reform that would be congenial to their interests. So their consent was a prerequisite for the passage and the implementation of the Affordable Care Act 2010. And this isn't just because, uh, you know, Obama was a neoliberal and, and de- dedicated to uh, advancing corporate interests. It was also because of the realization that uh, these powerful interests control uh, the U.S. healthcare sector, you know, which is 17 or 18 percent of U.S. GDP. Uh, they're in a position to to give their consent or withhold their consent when politicians want to shake things up. The argument of the book is that, yes, elections do relatively little. Elections are of relatively little importance when it comes to uh, determining what actually happens with policy, what policy changes do or do not succeed. Uh, The much more important factor has to do with the configuration of power uh, outside of the White House and outside of Congress. And that configuration of power has to do with uh, the powerful institutions that dominate society and that dominate uh, the politicians. Uh, it also has to do with social movements and the presence or absence of social movements which can disrupt things to such an extent that they alter the configuration of power and force the traditional uh, elite sectors to actually embrace uh, reforms as as a way of cutting their losses and restoring uh, 
uh, stability and order. So we look at a few historical examples where this has been true. Uh, we, if we think about some of the uh, the major um, periods of successful progressive change in U.S. history, we look at you know, in the 1930s and the 1960s to take two contexts. In both of these cases, the the social movements which were so powerful and so successful were not, for the most part, focused on the electoral realm. They were not focused on electing or pressuring politicians. They were more focused, in the case of the 1930s labor movement and the 1960s civil rights movement, uh, they were much more focused on building uh, the, the local capacity for disruption, uh, which would allow them to exercise pressure on the power elite within their, within their locales, within their workplaces. Um, so in the 1930s, the labor movement, workers went on strike thousands of times against their employers, which is a form of mass disruption at the local uh, workplace level uh, at the point of production that directly affected the interests of uh, the capitalist elite in the country. And one of the examples we look at in the book is the implementation of the Wagner Act, which legalized uh, the unionization of private sector employees in the country. And the only we argue that the only reason that that uh, that the reform was uh, finally implemented by the late 1930s and early 1940s uh, was that the employers starting in the auto industry came around to accept uh, that law, that law that Henry Ford and and GM and the others had so uh, violently resisted in the years prior to that. By the late 30s and early 40s, they came around to actually embracing the National Labor Relations Board that had been created under the act and inviting the board in to conduct union uh, union elections in their workplaces. And the reason why there was such a a dramatic change of position by uh, the auto industry giants and, and other sectors of the corporate elite was that there was this ferocious wave of labor disruption in their workplaces. So they, they saw unionization as actually a way to restore order. So it was, it was an instance of the corporate elite embracing a progressive change as a way of trying to cut their losses. They viewed it as a lesser evil option at the time. Um, and again, in the 1960s, this happens with uh, the effort to desegregate the South uh, and to, to end uh, Jim Crow uh, terrorism um, and segregation. Um, the movement in the South was not, uh, again, like in the 1930s, this movement was not primarily focused on uh, pushing politicians uh, or electing different politicians. You know, it was, it was mostly focused on uh, creating local pressure and local disruption um, that would force the economic elite uh, in places like Birmingham, Alabama, to come around and uh, finally support the demands of the movement as a lesser evil option. So this is uh, one of the clearest cases is in Birmingham in 1963. This is the, probably the most iconic uh, uh, local moment of the civil rights struggle in the South. And, you know, everybody's seen the images of the dogs and the fire hoses being used against black protesters in Birmingham. Uh, but the backstory of Birmingham is that it was actually the, the merchants in downtown Birmingham, including uh, the president of the local chamber of commerce, who were crucial in pushing the rest of the Birmingham white power structure to allow for desegregation. So the the chamber of commerce head uh, named Sidney Smyre uh, had always been a segregationist. Uh, He'd actually been a leader of the White Citizens Council in Birmingham in the 1950s. Uh, but in 1963, in response to this enormous disruption uh, in the spring of 1963, boycotts, uh, marches through the downtown, sit-ins uh, in the public places and, and in the businesses themselves, this, this uh, imposed enormous costs on the merchants in downtown Birmingham and created a real threat to their, their economic viability, their profits. Um, so it was the it was those sectors of the economic elite in Birmingham, represented by the Chamber of Commerce head, Smyre, uh, who came around and 
um, and uh, reluctantly embraced uh, racial integration and went to the other sectors of the power structure, like the police, like the mayor, like the city council, and told them we need to integrate uh, as a way of restoring uh, stability. So Smyer said in 1963, I'm still a segregationist, but I hope I'm not a damn fool. That is to say, he was he was intelligent enough to recognize that the only way to end the disruption was by conceding to some of the movement's demands. So we think that this this uh, moment, this Birmingham, uh, what happened in Birmingham, the way the movement succeeded has uh, really important implications for the current movement against police violence and white supremacy. And that if you want to if you want to rein in the police, this, you know, rampaging institution, which is totally out of control. Uh, if you want to rein them in, the way to do that is to impose costs on other sectors of the elite, uh, it, namely the, biz, the, uh, the business class, uh, retailers and, and, and other segments of, of the capitalist elite, uh, who will then go and put pressure on the police. Uh, you know, because the, the police and, and the mayors and the sheriffs, they couldn't care less uh, what most of the population thinks, but they do care what uh, what uh, the business elite says, uh, because after all, after all, it is business that ultimately calls the shots uh, in in most of our uh, cities and towns and states. Um, so if you can uh, create enough disruption that those economic sectors of the elite start to revolt against uh, police violence and and the and the uh, uh, disorder and, and rebellion that it is catalyzing, that's one way to uh, to uh, rein in the power and, and the violence of the police. Um, so that's one example of how I think that the, the historical case studies in the book could uh, apply to our, our current context. Awesome. Thank you so much, Kevin. There's, there's so many different discussions that, that come out of that. I mean, on one end, that's, that's an that's a great tactic, and it's this this piece of work is really important on two levels. For one, looking at tactics, but also for two, looking at ideologies and also the setup of the two-party system. And I think for this this time for this book to be discussed in the Obama administration is important because a lot of people who have become politically uh, active now or um, awoken to issues of of uh, U.S. politics, they think that. The U.S. was fine until Trump was elected, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. the importance of this book is it, it takes away those illusions. That mm -hmm. um, so we don't want to undermine that Trump is just status quo, but it's also that Trump is kind of like um, the ripping off the mask of the status quo of U.S. empire and how it has been acting. But there is an added danger and an added violence of the Trump administration, for sure, like yeah. against trans communities, uh, LGBT, uh, people of color, indigenous communities. They've been attacked even more. And But at the same time, it's, it's important to also note that the Obama administration had children shackled to yeah. their mothers during developmental years as well. And that's the importance of this work is it, it really – it seeks to take the face off of U.S. empire, colonialism, capitalism, and um, expose it. Like you said, of no matter who's elected, there are these challenges there, and that's a that's a really important thing that this that this piece brings out. And to couple that with corporate power, I mean, I've seen corporate power also adjust to being boycotted, such as since the Black Lives Matter movement has exploded, there's been a lot of performative apologies or mm -hmm. performative support for Black Lives Matter, which on an aesthetic level, I think is still important, but mm -hmm. they also know that it's also a kind of neutralizing effect that it has. Mm -hmm. Kind of like like um, if, if you were to compare this to the Do the Right Thing, the movie Spike Lee, uh -huh. it's Sal's Pizza Shop would have put a Black Lives Matter nowadays in their window to protect mm -hmm. the window, even though they were still, he was still racist. Mm -hmm. And you see these things and the way that they're trying to cover up themselves 
also something uh, by doing journalism in Denver, I've seen with Anadarko Petroleum out here, they have a handbook on activists that um, they refer to them as insurgents, which mm-hmm. really goes back and shows the importance of, of levers of power showing that people protesting corporations works and it does actually bring fear to them. And that's why they're hiring corporations like Pipe Paper Tiger to do surveillance and collect Facebook data on anyone who's opposing their corporate structure. So mm-hmm. I don't know if there's really a question there, if that inspires a comment from you, but I, I really just see that they, this is important of showing ideology and also this tactic is important, but it's like an ever evolving like strategy of, of tactics that this brings about. Yeah. Yeah. Those, those comments are, are really helpful. Um, and got me thinking about a few things. First of all, the way that elites respond to social movements, I totally agree that they are are scared right now. Uh, they're scared of the movement against white supremacy, the movement against the police. Uh, they're scared of the movement against fossil fuel pipelines, uh, you know, fossil fuels uh, executives. Uh, if you read the business press, uh, a lot of them are, uh, you know, terrified. They're, they're sounding the alarm bells. Um, about the strength of the movement and its ability to disrupt, both physically disrupt and legally disrupt through lawsuits and, and other measures, uh, the construction of pipelines and other fossil fuel infrastructure. And this is a signal to us that the movement is uh, is having an effect. And I, you know, I've always felt that. It, Reading the business press is one of the the best ways to get insight into how much impact the movement is actually having. You know, regardless of which movement we're talking about, any movement that is that is opposing corporate power in some way, uh, or or the power of the police or, or the military and so on. You read the business press and you get a candid uh, a candid account of how elites are actually responding. And I think that you know I, I agree with you that there seems to be this two track response. One is Heightened surveillance and um, and repression, uh, you know. So we see the the fossil fuels companies pushing for legislation to uh, criminalize uh, anti pipeline protests and um, you know basically uh, terrify people into into falling in line. And uh, we see um, you know this is uh, corporations and the state, of course, uh, mm-hmm. working to surve- surveil activists. And you know Facebook purging uh, anarchist uh, and other leftist uh, pages uh, just in the last few days. Uh, another example of this. So uh, certainly we do need to be uh, uh, very conscious of how the state and corporations are responding. Uh, and then the other the other prong of the elite response, which is uh, basically an attempt to co-opt the movement or perform. Uh, some semblance of wokeness or mm-hmm. uh, or um, you know anti-racist consciousness, you know. So businesses putting you know a, a sign in their in their window front, you know. That's I think I agree. We need to be cautious about that, and we need to understand that for what it is. Uh, but it's also a positive reflect a reflection of the movement's impact uh, because those businesses are potentially incurring some cost by putting a sign in their window. They're, they're incurring a, a, a risk that they're going to alienate some white racists. So, you know, there's, I think that even, you know, even if we take that as a, as a very cynical kind of gesture, which ultimately I think it is, in most cases, it's still a measure of the movement's power. Um, so I think that being skeptical is good, but also remembering that this is a sign of the movement's power uh, is also important. And then the other thing that your comments got me thinking about is the Biden campaign. And uh, to be honest, I, I haven't watched uh, any of the, the Democratic uh, convention uh, that's been going on. It's, it's too nauseating to me to, to watch. But, uh, you know, I have I have gotten some of the clips and I uh, via you know, news programs, and uh, I've read some of the transcripts, and I've I've seen some of the commentary about the convention. And, you know, there's a lot of discussion now about, uh, you know, among progressives, um, about how we're going to hold Biden accountable, uh, assuming that 
the Biden Harris ticket uh, succeeds and that, you know, Trump can't steal the election. And, uh, you know, I think this is a really important discussion. Um, but I think that we need to be realistic uh, as, a, as a left. Uh, when have we been successful in holding a Democratic president accountable? Uh, it didn't happen under Obama, uh, with maybe a few small exceptions. It certainly didn't happen under Clinton. Uh, it didn't happen under Carter in the late 70s. And it didn't really even happen uh, under the Johnson administration. But it has happened to some extent at certain key moments. And these are actually the same moments that I, I mentioned earlier, the 1930s, the FDR administration, and the early 1960s, uh, the JFK administration, and, and uh, maybe uh, to some extent during during the Johnson administration as well. Um, but in those cases, the cases where, you know, we could say that the movement did hold the president, the Democratic president accountable, it wasn't so much the result of the movement targeting the president himself or targeting Congress. It was the result of the movement creating this enormous disruption, which imposed costs, direct costs on the economic elite, uh, on the military, and uh, that's what really created the leverage uh, to be able to shift the administration's and Congress's policies in a progressive direction. Uh, because without taking on the economic and institutional elite directly, uh, it's very hard to imagine a scenario where we hold a Democratic president or a Democratic Congress accountable because they have so much countervailing pressure coming from the corporate elite uh, that uh, without taking on those forces directly, I don't think that we're, we're, we're going to be any more successful holding Biden accountable than we were with Obama. Uh, so I think that we, need to, we do need to think carefully about, about movement strategy and, and, and who we target with our protests. Uh, so I, I think that that's, that's one way in which um, the analysis in the book uh, does speak to um, the prospect of, uh, of a, a Biden presidency. And, you know, Regarding Trump, I'm uh, I'm in total agreement that you know, Trump is more dangerous uh, than Biden. Um, that there is a difference there, and I think that uh, you know we want to be careful uh, to uh, not to imply that elections make no difference. Elections do make some difference. You know, it's it, it was better to have Obama in office than it was McCain. It would be better to have Biden than it would Trump uh, because Trump is is you know, so dangerous and so reckless on so many levels that go uh, beyond uh, a Joe Biden. Uh, but at the same time, uh, it's, it's crucial that we don't have any illusions about what Biden represents uh, or what Harris represents. So, you know, I, I, I appreciate those comments and, uh, yeah, I've, I appreciated all that you've, that you've had to say about that. Nice. Yeah. And I, yeah, you you made a great point too, and I was just kind of, I was just kind of brainstorming and and just thinking out loud and responding to you in a in a conversational format. Yeah, that's, your your book levers of power. It just brought so many so many questions to me and good thoughts, and I, I really just can't recommend this book enough. It's it's a great book and a great time to release it. Yeah, I just really wanted to thank you for for being on the show today. Yeah, yeah, thank you. It's it's been really fun. Um, I did want to mention we, we've been uh, my co-authors and I and, and a, a few other folks as well have been uh, writing a few pieces which sort of uh, spin off from the analysis in the book and apply it to what's been happening this summer. So uh, we've written Where are those a, being released. Uh, I wrote a piece for Jacobin on um, the movement against the police in June. I think it was. Oh yeah, I read that mid, one. In June, that was released. Um, Michael Schwartz and I wrote a piece about uh, the pandemic and the, the role that uh, worker disruption in the workplace and, and consumer boycotts might play in enforcing, enforcing the 1% to, to finally confront the pandemic. Um, I think it was called uh, How the 99% Can Force the 1% to Fight COVID or something like that. And that was at Salon. Why? Let's see, what else have we... What else have we written? Um, I wrote a piece for Yes uh, magazine, um, which was about uh, it was sort of a summary of 
uh, of the arguments of the book with regard to uh, social movement strategy, and it talked about a few other historical examples too, like um, abolition in, in the 1860s. Um, and it was about, I think it was called uh, History Shows That uh, Sustained Disruptive Protests Work. Uh, and then we've we've been working on a few other pieces as well, uh, which which uh, haven't been published yet. But one of them is is actually on the the climate movement and the movement against pipelines, uh, and it talks about um, some of the the reactions from fossil fuel executives uh, that I alluded to before. Nice, and I know you've written about Dapple before in your um, other articles, and also Levers of Powers. I will link to these in the show notes as well. Uh, yeah, that would be great. These articles. Are there any other links or, or best ways people can find you or support your work? Uh, yeah, actually, I I guess I didn't need to give all those those article titles. I could have just mentioned uh, that I, I have a website. Uh, it's kevinyoung.org. Okay. Um, and there's you can you can go to the articles tab, and so my my recent stuff is available there. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of the Time Talks podcast. I want to thank Kevin Young for taking the time to be part of the show. Please support his journalism and writing by picking up his books or sharing an article or 10. He's written tons for Jack and Ben, Truth Out, Yes Magazine, and many more. Thanks to Awareness for the music as always. Please support the podcast on Patreon. Get Awareness's album Sushi Wave on Bandcamp. And support the other podcasts on the Channel Zero Network. See you next time. Peace.